Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11, 32 through 40. If you, as you know, we're going through the series, um, Looking Unto Christ. And, um, and so we're now covering uh, the forerunners to Christ. And we'll wrap up this subtopic and move into the gospel starting next time. So let us read the verse. What more, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to fight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword and went about in skins and of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. Apart from us, they should not be made perfect. If we when we look through this chapter, we see in this epistle, uh, especially in this chapter, we see 16 specific names mentioned. And on top of that, there are several groups of people that we see mentioned, and it's generally summarized. As we read in the first verse, the author is trying to wind up his, uh, his explanation by saying there's just not enough time to talk about every single saint of God that, that followed this path of faith. So since January this year, we've been talking about foreigners to Christ from the past. And so we covered Abel, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. And the reason why uh, we picked these individuals specifically is because more than others, they shined brightly as forerunners to Christ. Many, many of their lives serve as types and illustrations of the life of Christ. And so when we, when we scan through the Old Testament, it's not just people that we see. We see objects, events, typifying or illustrating, illustrating the, purpose, the person and work of Christ to us. Through the promise given to Abraham, God gave the Jewish people the privilege to be weaved into the, the, the story of redemption. So this redemption narrative was in the heart of God even before the creation of the world. And sadly, the same people that were given a sneak peek into the, this redemption story failed to recognize the fingerprints of God. And in, in the same people ultimately gave up their Messiah to be tortured and crucified by the Gentiles. Now, when we think about these things, we, it's easy to point blame at Jewish people, but we can also look at ourselves and say, you know, we were also blind at one time or another. The story of the Jewish people is the, the story of mankind. I don't know if you have this testimony, but I do in my past that, you know, we have said and did a lot of things out of sheer ignorance. We fail to recognize God's blessing and his power at work through the good and bad. But God always remains patient with us until his appointed time. And this is... This, you know, for those listening to me, whether it's in this room or online, know that God has been patient with you all along. As long as you have breath right now, now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Don't worry about the consequences. You are entrusting yourself in the hands of a gracious God, a good God. He will take care of you. I promise. He will take care of you. There's so much that can be said. So I, keep, I will keep repeating this phrase that he, the author Hebrew says, What more shall I say? One thing I want to highlight today is David. 
and, uh, and how David ultimately points to Christ. Now, David was the youngest of eight sons. He was a shepherd. I mean, his job was to take care of his father's sheep. He was essentially the least among his brothers. We know that because uh, as um, you know, Samuel comes and says, uh, uh, one among your sons will be, uh, uh, need to be anointed uh, as the next king. Jesse, his father, brings everybody else except David. And David, in his time as a shepherd, although it might seem insignificant, there are many tests and challenges that David went through as a shepherd that prepared him for the next season in becoming a soldier in Saul's army and eventually becoming the second king of Israel. We know the story really well, the story of David and Goliath. As Goliath was challenging the army of Israel to fight, uh, fight him, and he was mocking, openly mocking the God of Israel. David, the young boy who wasn't ready to fight in terms of we look in, in, in human eyes, he just could not stand by and watch this happen. So what does David say to Saul? First Samuel chapter 17, 34 to 37. I'll read this and it will be shown on the screen. But David said to Saul, I have been taking care of my father's sheep. Sometimes a lion or a bear would come and carry off a sheep off from, sheep from the flock. Then I would go after it and hit it. it would save, I would save the sheep it was carrying in its mouth. If it turned around to attack me, I would grab by its hair. I would strike it down and kill it. In fact, I have killed both a lion and a bear. I will do the same thing to this Philistine. He isn't even circumcised. He has dared the armies of the living God to fight him. The Lord that saved me from the paw of the lion, the Lord, he saved me from the paw of the bear, and he will save me from the powerful hand of this Philistine too. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. So we know the rest of the story. David kills Goliath. But as we read what David's faith statement says, the story of David and Goliath is not about David. It is not about Goliath. It is about the Lord. He, David himself says, it, The same Lord that saved me from the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. He was banking his trust, his faith in the Lord. And Saul, in return, somehow discerned the moment and he, he had nothing else to say but to say, May the Lord be with you. Now, whether he knew that or not, that was the greatest blessing that he could give to David at that moment. It's the greatest blessing that we can give to our children. Greatest blessing that can we give to somebody in our life. Say, may the Lord be with you. May the Lord be with you. Hallelujah. If the Lord isn't with us, we're, we're nothing, brothers and sisters. Do you sense that the Lord is with you? Have the eyes of faith to believe that the Lord is truly with you in the middle of your battles. Hallelujah. The greatest realization in, in our lengthy life of walking with the Lord is that the same Lord that helped us in the past is, going, is the same Lord that will help us in the next battle of our life. So my encouragement to you this morning is to lean on the Lord. Whatever you're going through. Try to go back in memory and to remember the ways the Lord has led you in the past. Impossible situations where you prayed a simple prayer and the Lord came through even beyond your expectation. Lean on the Lord. Lean on the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean on the Lord. Let Him direct your paths. Hallelujah. There's a lot to say about David, but... Some of the things I just want to state some obvious realities. You know, he, he wrote 73 out of the 150 Psalms. And Jesus himself said, David and the Holy Spirit wrote these Psalms. That's a high praise and a realization to think about that. Every Psalm that's written, not just by David, but every author in the scriptures have been in the Holy Spirit. This is the inspired word of God that we are reading. There's power in the words that has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. And for on Friday, uh, through Sister Nissi, we heard, you know, Jesus devoured the scriptures. He, he consumed the scriptures. 
And he quoted the Psalms frequently. Tim Keller has his famous book on, uh, on the Psalms called The Songs of Jesus. The Songs of Jesus. Just imagine Jesus singing the Psalms, reminding himself in his human humanity about the Father's will for him. This morning we read a Messianic Psalm, which I was rejoicing in the Lord about. Imagine Jesus singing Psalm 2. Imagine Jesus rejoicing in the Holy Spirit in his time alone with the Father and abounding in thanksgiving while communing with the Father through the Psalms. Jesus gave us a blueprint how to engage with scriptures. Now more about David. There are 59 references to David in the New Testament. And there are 17 verses in which Jesus is described as the son of David. So why is it why is it important that Jesus be the son of David? It's because God made a covenant with David. When David desired to build a house for the Lord, the Lord told David through Nathan that instead that his offspring will build a house for him. But not only that, in 2 Samuel 7, 16, which will be on the screen, he says, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The simple desire for David to build a house for the Lord. Not only the Lord, the Lord said, no, you are not the one to, to do this because of the blood on your hands. But your, your, your offspring will do it. But even going even before, beyond that. There is a messianic prophecy that the Lord shares through the prophet Nathan. That the Lord does not live in, in buildings built by human hands, but he himself will tabernacle in the midst of us, in human flesh, in the lineage of David. Jesus Christ, the God-man, will dwell in the midst of his people. That, that shows in your, in, to us that our simple desires to honor the Lord may lead to things that are beyond our understanding that the Lord will be pleased to give and, and the grand things that, that we can never even handle, that the Lord will handle these things for us and, and make us a testimony for many. Hallelujah. But we know the story of David and, you know, it didn't take many generations for this all to kind of seemingly fall apart. Many corrupt kings came to the lineage of David. But Isaiah later prophesy, prophesies and reminds the people of Israel the same he says in Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 5, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. With, with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and the faithfulness the belt of his loins. Even if it seemingly seemed like the, the tree of, of, of the David's lineage was cut down. Recently, uh, you know, we had to cut down a, a weeping willow in our backyard. And they said, we're going to leave a stump there. So in case it will sprout up in three months. If it doesn't, just go ahead and take out the stump. And that came to my mind when I read this. That from a stump of a tree, God caused a, a, a shoot, a branch to be, a bud to come out of that. When things seem seemingly impossible. This is the Lord again and again. This is the narrative of scripture over and over again. In the impossibilities, God has a purpose to fulfill that. To show that he is God. He is sovereign. That he has an eternal purpose. That he is working through even in the impossible dead situations of our life. He will rise up life. And in David, in this lineage, he rose up himself. Hallelujah. And since today we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday and the world is celebrating it and we're talking about Jesus being the son of David, I just want to remind us of some uh, verses relating these two realities. And I'm not going to go into too in-depth because I believe it will be talked about here in a bit. Acts chapter 2, tw uh, 29 through 36. Says, uh, Peter says this on the day of Pentecost. Very clear-minded, convicted, and logical. 
day of Pentecost. Peter says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Before being therefore a prophet, knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh seek corruption. But this Jesus God raised up of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 34, for David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you Crucified. Hallelujah. David, our patriarch, Peter saying, dead and buried in his tomb is here with us today. But there is an empty tomb as he heard this morning. Hallelujah. The greater David, the better David. David could not ascend to the heavens like Christ did. But the better David did. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father, enthroned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, fulfilling his covenant that the Davidic kingdom will be established forever. Jesus Christ is that offspring of David that is seated at the right hand of the Father forever and ever. He will never back out of his promises and his covenant. Romans chapter 1, 3 and 4, same message. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lastly, the last chapter in the book of Revelation the last few words that we see in scriptures, Jesus says, Revelation chapter twenty-two, sixteen. 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Amen. That is strategic that Jesus, it, Jesus excites that because he wants the people that are reading this to know that he has not forgotten his covenant. God has not forgotten his covenant. He is, he is the root and descended of, of David, that everlasting kingdom that, that will last from generation to generation. That promise will still stand for ages and ages and ages to come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When we go turn back to Hebrews chapter 11, and I will... Wrap up with this. I want to read all of this again. We zoomed into David. Now I want to zoom back. What more shall I say? What more shall I say? There are many people mentioned here. The things that I I really want to highlight. Verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy. Verse 39, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I don't know who this is for. And this is not a means for us to, you know, sometimes in the heat of arguments and things we say, you know what? You won't get another husband like me. You won't get another wife like me. You won't get another pastor like me or a church member like me. That comes out of our pride. But, you know, what I prayed for sometimes is a a level of self-forgetfulness. You know, that that we even forget all these things. that, That we are privileged or entitled. And instead, our testimony in heaven is that that family was not worthy of that person. That church was not worthy of that person. That workplace full of darkness was not worthy of that person. That school was not worthy of that person. And so I pray 
that each one of us develop a kind of self-forgetfulness that we don't see ourselves as privileged, but instead we're humbled that, Lord, you have counted me worthy to be in this situation right now. It seems chaotic. It seems worrisome. It, it, Lord, I don't know why I'm here, Lord, but thank you for counting me worthy to be here as a light, even if it's one, one candle in that place. Thank you for counting me worthy. And isn't that the, the testimony of Christ? When we walk with Christ, when we understand Christ, we understand that we are weaved into the story of Christ. Was this world worthy of Christ's arrival? I mean, just think about it. Like, were we worthy for having God come down in flesh? As an ordinary man, nobody could recognize him. He didn't have an aura or a glory about him. He was ordinary of ordinaries. This is Jesus. And my prayer for me is that I have that level of understanding about me that I will even forget, you know. Sometimes it's very hard in the midst of praise of people and people look up to you and all that. It, it becomes more of a thorn for us to understand that, that we are just ordinary. And so in any, everything that we do, whether it's in the workplace, in our families, in our schools, we have to die to ourselves, die to ourselves, our flesh, become ordinary, become servants, become the least of these. That needs to be the prayer that we struggle and wrestle with, brothers and sisters. This is the fight of our generation. This is the fight of our souls that we need to fight and die to ourselves daily so that we can become more like Jesus. And lastly, of whom the, uh, verse 39, there, you know, when you look at the stories of, of you know, there, there are many successes there, right? Quench the power of the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They made uh, strong out of weakness, mighty in war. There are a lot of good things that happened to those who had the faith, but also some people did not receive what was promised. And isn't that, isn't that interesting how Scripture puts both of it together and puts them in one category of faith? This, this answers a lot of our questions, really. You know, when we see healing take place in one family and the healing does not take place in another family. When you see successes in one family and, 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 and a lot of trials in another family. Does God love one more than the other? No. God has all given us a measure of faith. We have to walk in that measure of faith. God loves us all the same. Regardless of what we go through. But, the, but when challenges come our way, there are many ways to process this. If we pray and pray and pray, do not receive the answer to our prayers, know that, verse 40, that God had provided something better for us apart from us that they should not be made perfect. In other words, the reason why sometimes our prayers are delayed and maybe not answered is there's another purpose beyond our purpose. Our, our prayers are not being answered in that moment because God has something else going on behind the scenes. There are other people that need to be brought into the fold through your testimony, through your story. So walk in that assurance knowing that God, my gracious, good God is listening to my prayer. I have prayed. I am continuing to pray. I will, I'll pray until the, my last breath. But I also know that in this, in this holy Saturday-like atmosphere where there's, things are quiet, I'm not hearing from the Lord, know that I am still walking in the purposes of God. There is something God is doing at work in me right now. Let me end us off in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, God, that you spoke to us today and you continue to speak to us through the songs, through the exhortations, through the message that is to come through communion. Lord, we pray, oh God, for the mighty move of your spirit, oh Lord. Lord, I pray for anointing. Lord, I pray for, Lord, from head to toe, oh God, that each of us experience the fullness of your power and your strength so that we can be witnesses, oh Lord, that many more can come to the fold, oh Lord, in this church and in the, in the, in the mission stations that we have. I pray for special blessing over all the missionaries, pastors that are going through suffering, oh Lord, those we have prayed for here today, and Lord, those that, that Lord, will be commissioned, oh Lord, from this congregation and others, oh Lord, for your glory and for your kingdom. We pray and thank you. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.